Okay, folks, we're going to go back to the Kahoot game again for a second round. So this is going to be all about health informatics. Three questions for you, so I'll give folks uh, another moment to get going. So I am what is between you and lunch. So I'm hoping to make this interesting dynamic. It'll probably be slightly comical and bumbly, but that's kind of how it is with me. So we're going to go with that. Um, Lots of pictures, some video, if we can get all that to work and watching me navigate it all. All right, I think we're kind of stabling out at 13. the first time I've used this, so this is all a new fun experience for me as well. So my first question is, do you know what health informatics is? Um, So hopefully by the end of today, I can give you all some information about what health informatics is and why it's important to you as a care provider, but also a consumer as well, because we are all uh, consumers of, of health informatics. All right, next question. Have you used an electronic uh, medical record as, as a, someone providing care? distribution across the board some people not at all um, and then everything in between so that will be interesting as well while uh, electronic health records are a lot of what we talk about in health informatics it's certainly not the only thing we'll do our third and final question have you ever used telehealth <laughs> actually have some folks in here who have that's great I'm hoping for some audience participation when we get to that part of the conversation um, but most have not or aren't sure all right well great thank you bear with me while I swap this over well it all started as an ER nurse I was an ER nurse and it just was very inefficient to me and the only way to make it better in my mind was to make the technology work for us instead of against us. That being said, putting bad technology in is just as bad as not having any technology at all. So you can put in a system, but it, if it isn't done correctly with the proper staff, uh, it's gonna be, it can make things much more of a mess. And I would say that across any type of technology you use. It can really make things better it can really make things worse. So that is kind of where anybody who's an informatician applies themselves. Let's make it better. So today I'm hoping that you'll be able to, by the time we're done here today, that you'll be able to at least loosely define what health informatics is, understand why it's important to you, um, maybe be able to give an example of mobile health. I think you probably have already talked about that early today with the uh, MyFitnessPal. Uh, recognize what telehealth is, describe a basic data cycle, and explain what you can be, do to be more involved in health informatics. Please ask questions as we go. I'd like this to be more conversational than me just kind of labbing up here. So at any point, feel free to go to the microphone and ask some questions. So people ask me all the time, because I'm an informatician, what is health informatics anyway? So the uh, National Library of Medicine defines it as um, 
the interdisciplinary study of design development, adoption, and application of IT-based innovations in healthcare services delivery management and planning. You all know what that meant, right? I didn't, and I'm in it all the time. So what I really like to break it down, I'm going to give you a lot of examples of what health informatics is. That's really what we're going to look at today. But basically, to me, to boil it down, it's technology and healthcare that come together. And that's really the end of the definition. I think, it, like, like I just said, I think it's easier to show from a practical perspective. And so I'm going to show you some examples. And these examples are kind of where health informatics should be. So the things that aren't going right, the reasons why we should care about this as healthcare providers, as consumers of healthcare. So everybody had their favorite special slide that they made for the day. This one's mine, because I took the picture, but I made the bubble. So I don't know if you can see it very well, but it says, and I think we've probably all been there, in the physician's office, there's a doctor who says, we just got this electronic medical record and I wasn't trained on how to use it. They might grumble about some other things, as in it's hard to use, I, I don't know how to find stuff, bear with me while I click around. Those always kind of push us away from engaging with technology instead of embracing us. And you can see from this physician, he doesn't seem particularly interested in what he's doing. Um, I won't even talk about the ergonomics of his workstation, which are atrocious. That's a whole nother class. Here's another one. You know, this doctor is trying to navigate her way. I imagine her saying something like, it's only a few more clicks and then I can get to this kid's medication list. She's trying to find her way in the medical record. And the mother's saying, does the, does the doctor even know that I'm in the room? So that disconnect that everybody worries about definitely happens a lot of the time. Finally, you can see this, I will assume, teenagerish young lady who is saying, well, this is kind of awkward. I can totally see that he's looking at somebody else's information. So totally disengaging in the conversation. These are all examples of what gives um, technology and healthcare a bad rap and why we need to insert ourselves to make it better. Um, medical records, you know, I think most places have tried to at least partially go to electronic records, but it wasn't that long ago that most people had a room like this. Um, people worry about privacy and security. This is a much bigger problem and it's everywhere. I would say most hospitals still have at least a closet that looks like that, maybe not a whole room. So, you know, really trying to make things more secure. What you can't see in this particular view of the picture is in the top left hand corner, there's a, a tile leaking down. So you can see that the water might be starting to seep in a little bit. Another reason why technology is important is uh, when I started my nursing career, physicians wrote their notes and they wrote their orders and physicians cannot write well. It was always a challenge and a lot of really bad things happened because nurses or unit secretaries who would transcribe those written notes misread what the doctor was saying. This is an example of a prescription that was written. Um, you can make your own guess about what it says. I'll show you in the next slide. Um, but it was, it was um, misrepresented when it was filled and a, a serious medical error happened. So it was dispensed as Prozac, intended to be Buspar. So two different medications were given. Um, so those are just some of, the re some of the reasons. I'm gonna show you a video next about why, why this even matters. Um, I think we've come a long way in the past 10 years, and at least we've got most folks starting to use electronic medical records. I would say that we have a long way to go because they don't use it well yet. This is my first attempt at video, so bear with me. So this is gonna be Regina Holiday. She is a patient advocate and artist who um, has a story to tell, which she'll tell in this video, but really has become um, an advocate for um, electronic medical records and people having their own information. So it's three minutes long. Hopefully it will. I'm Regina Holiday, and I'm a patient's arts advocate. And I love health IT, because with access to information, you can help your family members. You see, my husband had kidney cancer, and the end of his life would have been better if we had had timely access to the electronic medical record. So I love health IT, and I love what's going on right now, because it's about access, information, and sharing. When my husband 
was in the hospital and I was researching to try to get his record. I was asking everybody. I was asking the nurses and the techs and the other doctors because the person in charge of my husband's care was out of town. And, um, and we have very little access to information. I spent weeks trying to get more information and actually see the record. Finally, I went down to medical records and was told it would be 73 cents per page in a 21-day wait to see my husband's medical record in the hospital he'd been continuously hospitalized in. I couldn't believe it. The very next day, the doctor said, um, we're sending you back to the other hospital. You're going to go get the medical record. I said, well, I've tried. They won't give me the medical record. They said they will now. You're going as a courier. And I went back, and they printed the whole record out in an hour and a half. And I gave it to the new doctors, and they looked at it for about an hour. And then they gave it back to me and said, here, this is safest with you. If you always have access to your husband's medical record, he's going to get the best care. And I read that document in about three hours, and I was astounded because it was filled with actionable data that if we could have only seen it while my husband was being cared for, it would have impacted his care and created a better living condition for us all. My husband was hospitalized in five facilities in 11 weeks. We went through multiple transfers, we went through 46 ambulance transports. I've looked at EMRs from multiple companies, and I found out how important it is to have coordinated care in this country. My husband finally went to hospice, and when we went to hospice, they wanted me to leave the room while they took his history. I said, no, I'm going to stand over there in the corner because you're going to need me. And I had my binder right in front of me of Fred's medical record. And then they started asking him questions. And he was so sick and he hurted so bad. And he turned to me and said, Reggie, show them the record. It says the answers to the questions. And I could because I had it with us. I had access to the data. And if there is one thing that we could change by telling this story, it's that access to your electronic medical record can change your life, can save your life, but also at the end of your life can make you happier and whole. And I am honored to have the opportunity to do that. So I've been showing that video for 10 years now. Um, at the time, it was kind of shocking. And I show it a lot now. And a lot of people say, well, things have changed a lot. Yeah, in some parts of the country they have. But in other parts of the country, they have not. And it still takes way too long to get paper records if you need them. We really need to be becoming more interoperable and be able to get that data to be exchanged more quickly for all the reasons that Regina talks about in her video. So the last thing kind of on the sad negative side of it all that I wanted to show is that as of just a few years ago, it was proven yet again that the third leading cause of death in the United States is preventable, preventable medical errors. That should be astounding to all of you. I say it a lot and it still astounds me. Heart disease, cancer, and medical errors. So in hospitals, information um, is not getting to who needs to get it in a timely fashion and medical errors are happening all the time. The wrong meds are given, the wrong way is, it is given, wrong tests are ordered, information isn't flowing correctly. This is all why we need to make the system better. Moving on to the fun side. So what, what about health, what, let's talk about health informatics, the fun side of it. What we can do, what we can do to in, inject ourselves into this conversation. So this is an example of how this should go correctly. Um, I really did make those rather small, didn't I? It says, let's look at your medical information together. So this is, a, I presume, a physician um, and, and his patient. Let's look at this chart together. And she says, oh, I'm actually, I'm not allergic to, to Paxil. And, and so they have that conversation together and they can validate the information that's in that chart. There's a long standing assumption that the medical chart was the physicians to own and not share. And 
it's, it's not. It's our information. It's our data. We need to be able to know what's in it and to be able to validate it and to work as a collaborative team with the physician, any care provider. This is another example where um, the provider, I assume, is showing this gentleman his lab results and he's able to show him a chart of how he compares to men his own age in his county. Well, that's pretty cool. That might make a difference in how somebody changes their behavior because they can actually see how it impacts them. So instead of saying, well, you know, smoking kills, you can say men your age in your county have died from lung disease and you can really make that a lot more tailored to the actual person and, and hopefully get more buy-in. And then finally, no, no cute little uh, blurbs, but I thought it was another example of what I perceive as, as a physician engaging with a, a younger gentleman to show him his information, to show him his data, to become in, involved in that care together as a partnership. So that's how I envision health informatics working for us again, instead of against us. Any questions on that? I'm going to kind of move away from the whole electronic health records business. So then there's telehealth. Um, telehealth is any time you can provide care via a camera. Um, it has to be done in a very secure way. People always say, well, I can do that with my phone. You can, but it's not particularly safe or secure, so you would want to be very careful about what you said on your, on your phone. Um, but telehealth can be really, really important in states like Maine where uh, we can provide care to people that are very rural. So um, in our particular state, well, I'll get to more examples. This is, a, this is a great picture of a nurse who is able to see um, her client, who I will assume is at home. She can see his information, and she's able to talk to him and give him some information. So this is an example of um, some type of care link at home, um, which is another type of a telehealth service. And keeping this elderly gentleman who's on oxygen, you know, maybe out of an emergency department. So that's helping with efficiency of care, reducing costs, and I'm sure he really enjoys getting that call from her whenever she calls. I, I bet that really feels good to him. So that's one example of telehealth. This is another example, um, and it's a good example because it's something that we do here in Maine. So in emergency departments where it's very rural, you can have um, specialists from the cities dial in and see what's going on. So you can kind of see this person has a droop on the left-hand side of her face. So let's imagine that this is in Presque Isle and there's no neurologist on call at that time of day in Presque Isle, but this person might be having a stroke and needs immediate care. You can put them in an ambulance, but that takes hours to get to that next hospital. Um, I think I just lost my mic. Oh. Um, so instead, that camera there can actually dial in. They can dial in as close um, so that they can see how your pupils react. That's how close these cameras can dial in. They're very, very specific. So this particular person can have a consult, a virtual consult from a neurologist hours away and tell that doctor in Presque Isle what, sh what care should be provided immediately. Sometimes in these cases, care needs to be provided immediately. So that's another example of telehealth. Um, I know of another program in the state of Maine where um, there's telehealth service, mental health telehealth services on our islands because it's very hard for folks to get mental health services by coming all the way in on a boat and then go back. So they have set up telehealth services on these islands for, for folks that need to get mental health services out there. I think that's really cool. It started as a pilot, but it's been uh, implemented on many of the islands. Um, the VA does a, a lot with this as well as far as getting veterans that live very rurally care they need um, from the Togus Center in, um, in the Augusta area. So more great examples. Any questions about telehealth? So mobile health, when we talked about this a little bit this morning when Carrie presented the, uh, the apps and the information that gets put into apps. Um, so mobile health is, health is any type of uh, health care that is mobile. It, it 
the definition wasn't even worth putting up because it's different all the time. Um, I looked up a few definitions and it had used the term PDAs. I mean, that's a term that's about 15 years old now, but it, it, it was like before you had a cell phone, for those that don't remember, it was like a, like a virtual assistant sort of before smartphones. So they're, they're mostly outdated, but it's basically any type of device that gives you um, information. So lots of examples, and really this is about the app culture. People wanting to get care on their phone. Um, where we need to inject ourselves as informaticians is to make sure that that care is quality, efficient, and safe. Just because you're an app developer and you know how to market doesn't mean you're providing a safe product for, your, for whoever's purchasing an app. Apps are currently not regulated, although there's talk about making some of them regulated, um, because people trust the information that they see on their app, which isn't always safe. This is an example of, of an iPhone in particular, um, very recently in the news. I won't get into it because I get too excited and it takes too long to talk about, but Apple has developed the first um, electronic health record. Like if you have a Apple phone now that you've updated, you, you can see that you have an EHR on your phone right now. Um, a lot of large healthcare systems have bought into this, like Geisinger, nothing around here yet. Um, about six of the largest ones have bought into this. So what this means is it's the first time that information is going to be exchanged. And again, it's very exciting, it's breaking. Um, but I don't, wanna, I don't wanna get in the way of lunch, so maybe we can talk about that at the breakout session. Um, it's, it's like, it's changing the industry. There's the record. That's, that's exactly what it looks like. So you can, if you have uh, the health app on your phone right now, you go in here and then you can select if you have a care provider um, that uses this. Um, Partners in Boston is probably the closest organization that I'm familiar with. Um, talking about really cool things um, from the mobile health perspective is the Apple Heart Study. So if you have an Apple Watch and it checks your heart rate, you can participate, I do, um, in a heart study that, that uh, analyzes your heart rhythm. So you don't ever get to see this information, but you sign into and get, give consent on your app and you're part of this study. So they're collecting this heart rhythm data for all these people that use their, their phones. I mean, I think of it at, from the perspective of the person doing the study, although I'm sure it was a lot of work to set up the app, that's a great way to get people to participate in your study. I mean, how easy is that? Your consent is in, embedded in there. I think it's just the first of what might be a really interesting way to collect data for studies in the future. So that's really cool. That's available um, to everybody. You can sign up um, and you usually have to wait to participate um, but my husband and I both do it, it's pretty cool. All right. This is another example of an Apple Watch story. So this was um, a young mother who had her watch on. It was over 120. I couldn't feel it going fast. I couldn't feel it beating hard. They, you know, did some lab work, um, gave me some IV fluids, and then with the lab work, they noticed my thyroid was out of whack. I had no idea that even existed, but it can be fatal if left untreated. Come to find out, it could be a life-threatening thing, so the watch kind of saved her life when you find that out. So that person had something called thyroid storm, which if you're an emergency room nurse is the type of stuff that you take a test on when you get certified and everybody knows about thyroid storm, it can be, th it can be fatal. Um, and this particular 
person was saved because she didn't feel her heart racing. Most people do, but not everybody does. Most people feel 120 when they're sitting watching TV, but she didn't. So this kind of brought it to her attention in a very passive way. She was already using the watch for other reasons, and this, this made all the difference for her. So the next thing I wanted to talk about is, is these are all kind of new kind of, you know, very trendy things that happen, but we need to also realize what these tools can do for the other end of the spectrum. So the third world countries that don't have a strong healthcare infrastructure. I'm gonna show you two videos that um, talk about how simple devices made a big difference in, in healthcare. So you're gonna hear the poster presentation of a young physician who did a trial, I think it's in Zimbabwe, around how she was able to provide um, the study for women who are, um, were HIV positive that didn't get regular care and how they were able to make an impact with a flip phone. I'm a medical student at the University of Pennsylvania, and this summer I worked together with Click Diagnostics um, to come up with a project that would try to find a way to, serve, to screen for cervical cancer um, in a way that would be able to serve rural women living in areas where there are no gynecologists. Um, so we were in Botswana. We took 100 uh, HIV positive patients and we were using a cell phone uh, camera to basically approximate colposcopy. So in Botswana, uh, there's one pathologist for the entire country. So in terms of screening for cervical cancer using pap smears, it's pretty infeasible. They have to take samples, send them to foreign countries, um, have them looked at there. Often samples get lost or it takes a long time to get them back and the process is very expensive. So how do you screen for cervical cancer in a place where you have a lack of pathologists? There is uh, a technique that's called VIA, visual, uh, Visualization and Inspection of the Cervix of the Seed acid, where you take regular household vinegar, white vinegar, you place it on the cervix for three minutes, and precancerous cells on the cervix that have a higher nuclear to cytoplasm ratio, or less cytoplasm, um, they have less water, they dehydrate quicker, and they turn white. So you can see in this picture here, this is a patient who does have an acetal-white lesion here um, that's deemed a precancerous lesion and needs to be treated. Um, so uh, basically what we were trying to do was see if um, our camera photos, so we used a digital camera um, on the cell phone that would basically, it has a zoom and it can blow up a picture of the cervix well enough to see, um, you know, after the, the application of acetic acid if there have been precancerous changes. Um, and the reason why we used a cell phone camera is because in areas where there's no internet or there's no computer, um, with the technology that Click Diagnostics has put together, you can send, um, you can take a patient history on the cell phone. Um, you take those photos and uh, the whole document together is sent via cell phone satellite to a website where gynecologists or trained professionals in women's health can log on, make a diagnosis, and send the diagnosis back to um, the nurse midwife or the community health worker that's working with these women in a rural area, um, and then these women can be treated. So we're still awaiting results. We're very positive. Um, so that was done in 2009 um, on, a, on a Nokia flip phone in a country that has no internet uh, infrastructure, so all cell data. So really able to impact who got care because there wasn't a lot of money and services to go around and get uh, those precancerous cells taken care of for this woman um, who had never been to the physicians before. I, I know a little bit of the backstory to that one. So. I'm going to skip forward um, just for the sake of time. And I just wanted to talk briefly about the data that comes from all these systems. So why, why do we care about it all? We care about it because we want to collect data. And why do we want to collect data? Because we want to impact change. Um, there's only so much time, money, and energy in any country to impact change. And if we can use the money more carefully, we can provide better change. So this is kind of a, just an example that I thought might make sense is if, if you are um, a college student, newly diabetic college student, and you're putting your calorie intake into your smartphone, um, and then you're able to transmit that to your, your PCP, your PCP then has all that data instead of 
you know, the piece of paper that you may or may not have uh, written it down on, or it's kind of crumpled up, or you didn't write the dates correctly, so no one knows when this happened, you can download this to the EHR at the physicians, um, which then can be shared with uh, all the care team who need to know it, not just the physician, but the entire care team. What's interesting is then that data, the, the name and the identifiers can be removed and then you can look at all the data. So wouldn't it be then cool to look at all of the data of all college age diabetics and be able to see trends um, in, in that data? What we really want to be able to do is look at that at the micro macro level and then in, inject an intervention and know if you're making a difference. And that's really what this is all about. I always use the uh, example of the smoking teenage parents. Uh, mother, if you collect the data, you know what counties, let's say as an example, to impact that change. Maybe Cumberland County, there aren't a lot of young teenage pregnant smoking mothers but maybe in another part of the state there are. And so we would want to use the little money that we have to impact that change in those particular areas. And that's why collecting data is important. You want to collect good data, but that's a whole nother lecture. Um, once you collect this data and you are excited about it and you want to impact change, there's a lot of graphs, tools that you can use to really make your presentation powerful. Um, we teach a class in the health informatics program, the master's degree program that I oversee, uh, called Tableau, which this is a Tableau chart. So taking data and really be a, being able to make that data impactful to the person that is, is looking at it. So if you want to go to stakeholders, uh, somebody that's giving you a grant, giving you money, that's giving you space, you want to be able to tell them why this data matters and you can make these really impactful um, charts because they don't really want to listen to you for an hour. They want to look at the chart and make a decision and move ahead. So lastly, as I wrap up, let's see how I'm doing on time. That'll give us maybe a minute for questions. Um, that is like the fastest way, that's the fastest I've ever done that, what is health informatics. There is so much more we could talk about. We can talk about things this afternoon, but I just wanted to make sure that I covered everything. So what this is, is this is a, a, a word cloud from the syllabus from the Intro to Health Informatics class that we offer um, our graduate students. And the things that are important are consumers, data, healthcare, engagement, um, system impact, uh, how we exchange the information, telehealth, standards, protocols, life cycles, regulation, assessment, education, collaboration, population. All of those things are things that we need to learn about and leverage so that we can all be better consumers of, of health informatics. So then the age old question, well, why, why does this matter to me or what can I do about this? So no matter where you are, if you engage with technology, here are some things that you can do. Learn to advocate for yourself. If you're using a piece of technology and the technology doesn't work for you as a, as a uh, clinician, then you need to talk to somebody. You may have an informatician on your team uh, they may be called something else like a clinical analyst. Um, in large hospitals, you'll definitely have that. Talk to that person. Say, this doesn't work for me. This doesn't work for my workflow. Is there anything we can do about this? It doesn't have the right things on the pick list. I need to have X, Y, and Z, and it's not there. Advocate to make that system better. Um, because, know your informatician. I'm getting ahead of myself. Advocate to have an informatician. If you have a smaller practice and nobody's doing this work, there needs to be somebody, at least somebody that is the point person to be the contact with the technology company, the vendor. At least somebody that might have a little bit of information, maybe not a master's degree, but a little bit of information about how to be that liaison in, in a thoughtful, uh, efficient way. Um, educate yourself about the session, the system that you use. If your facility offers training, go to the training, be engaged in the training, put your phones away during the training. Don't be late, don't leave early. Really sit there and learn the system. Lastly, I would say, don't make the computer a barrier to connecting with your clients. You can do a lot of little things to, to really connect with them. And the first one being looking away from the computer and making eye contact with that client. You wanna be doing that probably every 20 seconds. Put your information in, 
take your hands away from the computer and make contact with that person. It's a little thing you can do, but it makes a big impact because it, feel, it makes them feel like you're being heard. And then tell them that you're just gonna put their information in. If you really wanna get crazy, show them the information that, that, that you're putting in. Show them the screen because then they can help you validate it. Oh no, I said that, I didn't say that I was 120, I said I was 130 pounds. So helping to validate as they put it in and making it a team approach. Um, I think that's it. So, and it's perfectly on time. Um, I think we'll probably wait for questions to this afternoon. So breakout session is gonna be really informal. Um, bring your questions, bring your topics of things to discuss. I can always talk about anything. So what, whatever we go with is what we're gonna go with. So thank you for your time and attention. Thank you, Megan, that was amazing. I am really interested in that health record app because no matter where I am, if I can share that wherever I'm seeking treatment, that's pretty amazing. Yeah. So I'll look forward to hearing more about that.